part two. Uh, in today's new world, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. Uh, they will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even. And so making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime, but they will be happy in situations where they oughtn't to be happy. But let me ask you this. You're talking about a world that could take place within the confines of a totalitarian state. Hmm. Let's become more immediate, more urgent about it. We believe, anyway, that we live in democracy here in the United States. Do you believe that this brave new world that you talk about uh, could, let's say, in the next quarter century, the next century, could come here to our shores? I think it could. I mean, I, I, that's why I feel it's so extremely important here and now to start thinking about these problems, not to let ourselves be taken by surprise by... I can't. I'm so sorry that I'm being so snarky, but... You know, we were warned a long time ago. <laughs> These are like our parents, right? Who, if they gave a shit about their country, their children's lives, freedom, sovereignty, you would think that they would talk about it more address it, prevent it. I mean, I don't know if it is, if it's actually preventable because the people behind this are uh, international and largely invisible. The and, and new advances in technology. I mean, the, for example, in, in regard to the use of the, of the drugs, we know there's enough evidence now for us to be able, on the basis of this evidence, and using a certain amount of creative imagination, to foresee the kind of uses which could be made in a, uh, by people of bad will with these things, uh, and to attempt to, to forestall this. And in the same way, I think with these other methods of uh, propaganda, we can foresee and we can do a good deal to forestall. I mean, after all, the, um, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. It's you write in Enemies of Freedom, you write specifically about the United States. You say this, writing about American political campaigns. You say, all that is needed is money and a candidate who can be coached to look sincere. <laughs> political principles and plans for specific action have come to lose most of their importance. The personality of the candidate, the way he is projected by the advertising experts, are the things that really matter. Well, this is... Uh uh, during the last campaign, there was a great deal of uh, this kind of uh, statement by the uh, advertising managers of the campaign parties, this idea that the, uh, the candidates had to be merchandised as though they were soap or toothpaste, and that you had to depend entirely on the personality. I, I mean, the personality is important, but there are certainly people with an extremely amiable personality, particularly on TV, who might not necessarily be very good... Uh, uh, in political uh, positions of political trust. Well, do you feel that men like Eisenhower, Stevenson, Nixon, with knowledge of forethought, were trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the American public? Uh, no, but they were, they were being advised by powerful um, advertising agencies who were making campaigns of a quite different kind from what had been made before. And I think we shall see probably... Uh, all kinds of uh, new devices uh, coming into the picture. I mean, the, for example, this thing which got a good deal of publicity last autumn, a subliminal projection. I mean, as it stands, this thing, I think, is of uh, no menace to us at the moment. But I was talking the other day to one of the people who has done most experimental work in the in psychological laboratory with this, were saying precisely this, that it is not at the moment a danger, but once you've established a principle 
uh, that something works, you can be absolutely sure that the technology of it is going to improve steadily. And I mean, his view of the subject was that, uh, well, maybe they will use it to some extent in the 1960 campaign, but they will probably use it a good deal and much. I guess people were too busy being enslaved to actually question uh, art that was happening at the time, such as A Brave New World, um, Orwell's 1984. I guess they were too busy raising their families or, you know, worried about stupid shit like people are now. Maybe that's... Maybe that's the excuse that I can hand the generation before now. Like, why weren't you paying attention to these sorts of interviews when you clearly realized that you were enslaved to some degree, which we are largely enslaved now? more effectively in the 1964 campaign, because this is the kind of rate at which technology advances. And we'll be persuaded to vote for a candidate that we do not know that we are being persuaded to vote exactly. for. Exactly. I mean, this is the rather alarming nature, that you're being persuaded below the level... Do you ever truly know anyone? I mean, what a stupid comment, Wallace. I'm not surprised your son is just as lame. ...level of choice and reason. In, uh, in regard to advertising, which you mentioned just a little ago, in your writing, particularly in Enemies of Freedom, you attack Madison Avenue, which controls most of our television and radio, advertising, newspaper advertising, and so forth. Why do you consistently attack the advertising uh, agency? Well, no, I, I think that uh, advertisement plays a very necessary... Because advertisers are inherently manipulative. And when I had my hobby businesses, I did not advertise. I found it philosophically against my moral fiber to try to convince somebody to buy something that I was making based upon um, a superficial claim like most advertisers do, which daily insult my intelligence as a thinking human being. They will, but... Also, I must add that mass consumerism is a distraction and, an and an, another distraction, much like your job, right? Much like your entertainment. The danger, it seems to me, in a democracy is this. I mean, what does a democracy depend on? A democracy depends... Also, stop using the word democracy. We are a republic, okay? And even I'm noticing RFK is using that word in his new campaign endeavors to restore a true democracy. It is such an overused and inadequate term. On the individual voter making an intelligent and rational choice for what he regards as his enlightened self-interest in any given circumstance. But what these people are doing, I mean, what both for their particular purposes, for selling goods, and the dictatorial um, propagandists are doing, is to try to bypass the rational side of man and to appeal directly to these unconscious forces below the surface, so that you are, in a way, making nonsense of the whole democratic procedure, which is based on conscious choice of, on rational ground. Of course, well, maybe, maybe I, you have just answered this, this next question, because in your essay, you write about television commercials, not just political commercials, but television commercials as such. And how, as you put it, today's children walk around singing beer commercials and toothpaste commercials. Oh, my God. This is so true jingles, um, people memorizing. I remember as a child, like, flipping out because I needed this toy or this record album or 
you know, whatever was on trend at the time or whatever was programmed into our psyche. And then you link this phenomenon in some way with the dangers of a dictatorship. Now, could you spell out the connection or how do you feel that you have done so sufficiently? Well, I mean, here, okay, this whole question of children, I think, is a terribly important one because the children are quite clearly much more suggestible than the average grown-up. And uh, again, I suppose that, uh, that for one reason or another, all the propaganda was in the hands of one or very few agencies. You would uh, have a, an extraordinarily powerful force playing on these children who, after all, are going to grow up and be adults quite soon. Uh, I do think that uh, this is not an immediate threat, but it, it remains a possible threat. And you said something to the effect in your essay that the children of Europe used to be called cannon fodder, and here in the United States they are television and radio fodder. Well, as uh, after all, they, you can read in the uh, in the trade journals the most lyrical accounts of how necessary it is to get hold of the children, because then they will be loyal brand buyers later on. And do you see what's happening today? The children are being programmed for uh, Marxist ideology in schools with um, the LGBTQIA P agenda, right? Children are the target and the most easily suggestible in terms of creating the next generation. Wrong. But uh, I mean, again, the, you just translate this into political terms. The dictator says they will be loyal ideology buyers when they're grown up. We hear so much about brainwashing as used by the communists. Do you see? Here we go. Tavistock Institute out of London, School of Economics, I believe, was integral to uh, the tactics used to uh, brainwash Edward Bernays, right, who was the nephew of Freud and one of the lead, I don't know if you could call it executive or think tanker for all these different um, non-NGO entities. This is 1958, people. What is our excuse right now? Any brainwashing other than that, which we've just been talking about, that is used here in the United States? Other forms of brainwashing? <laughs> Not in the form that has been used in China and in Russia, because uh, this is uh, essentially the application of propaganda methods the most violent kind to individuals. It's not a shotgun method like the, uh, the advertising method. It's a way of getting hold of the person and playing both on his physiology and his psychology till he really breaks down and then you can implant a new idea in his head. I mean, the descriptions of the methods are, are really blood curdling when you, you read them. And not only methods apply to political prisoners, but the methods applied, for example, to the training of the young communist administrators and missionaries, they receive a, an incredibly tough kind of training, which may cause it about 25% of them to break down or commit suicide, but produces 75% mm. of completely one-pointed fanatics. The question, of course, that keeps coming back to my mind is that... And do we not, or do we have fanatics in this country right now? I personally um, feel like if you could label me, I'm a sovereignty fanatic, right? A free thinking fanatic, a person who wants to be treated like an adult and not a slave. And I am not infantilized like most uh, people of adult age in America. It's like, I look at people, I listen to people, and I'm like, wow, these people really didn't graduate past 10th grade in maybe 4th grade even in policy. 
ideas, strategies, um, the way that they behave, the lack of emotional control, nervous system regulation. I mean, it's really quite astounding. This. Obviously, politics in themselves are not evil. Television is not in itself evil. Atomic energy is not evil. And yet you seem to fear that it will be used in an evil way. Why is it that the right people will not, in your estimation, use them? Why is it that the wrong people will use these various devices and for the wrong motives? Well, I think one of the, uh, of the reasons is that uh, these are all power. instruments for obtaining power, and obviously the passion for power is one of the... Listen, I haven't watched this. I mean, I don't think like I'm some like super genius because I'm able to foresee what topic is going to come up next, but I mean... I am pretty impressive and that's not coming from like a narcissistic standpoint but from a very realistic one. One of the most moving passions that exist in man and after all this is all democracies are based on the proposition that power is very dangerous and that it's uh, extremely important not to let any one man or any one small group have too much power for too long a time after what are the British and American constitutions accept devices for limiting power. And all these uh, new devices are extremely efficient instruments for the imposition of power by small groups over larger masses. Well, you ask this question yourself in Enemies of Freedom. I'll put, the, I'll put your own question back to you. You ask this. In an age of accelerating overpopulation, of accelerating overorganization, and we're not overpopulated. We're not over, we are over accelerated in terms of like organizations, but they're all uh, liberal, run, owned, funded, 24 7 think tanks. So it's like, obviously, this has been in the works for a long time. And obviously, our government is. It features actually um, one party, and um, and it's run by the deep state globalists. And um, you know, I am against the border being open, okay? Because we're not vetting people. It's creating all kinds of massive crime. It's creating um, Mexican cartel, drug running killing other you know other countries are getting in on the action as well it's creating dangerous situations for very vulnerable populations that are being extorted out of large amounts of money their children's safety is drastically reduced due to crimes of a sexual nature um, against children and um oftentimes teen age and you know adult women so you know all these like ideas that they're trying to convince us are largely humanitarian are absolutely the opposite ever more efficient means of mass communication how can we preserve the integrity and reassert the value of the human individual. You put the question, now here's your chance to answer it, Mr. Huxley. Well, this is obviously, first of all, it's a question of education. Uh, I think it's uh, terribly important to uh, insist on individual values. I mean, what is, uh, there is a tendency, as um, you probably read a book by White, The Organization Man, it's a very interesting, valuable book, I think, where he speaks about the new type of group morality, group ethic, which uh, speaks about the group as though the group were somehow more important than the individual. As if the hive mind is more powerful than individual creativity, imagination, and intelligence. 
That's the greatest misnomer of, of postmodern society. But uh, this seems, as far as I'm concerned, to be uh, in contradiction with uh, what we know about the genetical makeup of human beings, that every human being is unique. And it is, of course, on this uh, genetical basis that the whole idea of the value of freedom is based. And I think it's extremely important for us to uh, stress this in all our educational life. And I would say it's also very important to teach people to be on their guard against the sort of verbal booby traps into which they're always being laid, uh, to, to analyze the kind of things that are said to them. Uh, well, I think there is this whole educational side, of, and I think there are many more things that one could do to... to and I'm going to end this part, too, just because I, I just want to piecemeal it, because I think that there are so many important points in this interview that... Um, Public education, by and large, is meant to create compliant slaves. And with that, I will leave you to watch to your own devices, and then in, I'll do part three maybe later or tomorrow.